anybody love Jesus in this place today? Come on, faith family, if you love him, can we just take like 10 seconds and give the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords the greatest standing ovation of praise? Come on, you can do better than that because he's been better to you than that. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because he's been faithful, because he's been a protector, because he's been a provider for every door that is open, for every door that is shut. How great, how magnificent, how powerful is our God. We lift you up today. Woo, great God that you are. Father, thank you for your presence that we already sense here and at every location. Lord, we declare, have your way today. Do whatever you want to do. We are ready and receptive to receive. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Come on, everybody say it. Oh, are you glad to be in God's house? Do you like who you are praising next to? Okay, if you don't, change your seat now. Change your seat now. You got time. You want to be on the right row. But come on, give somebody a high five or a handshake or a smile before you take your seat. Come on, tell them happy anniversary. Hallelujah. Well, it is an absolute honor and a privilege, to say the least, to be back at Faith Family Church. Uh, Pastor Mike took the words right out of my mouth. I've been coming for the last, I believe, 11 years or so. So I for real am family. So if you're like, I ain't never seen you before, I'm your cousin from the great country of Texas. <laughs> that you haven't met, and uh, it's, it's always an honor to be here, but especially on this day, uh, to celebrate 35 years of God's faithfulness. I'm telling you, I, I literally stand in awe of that because, as was mentioned, my wife and I, we planted our church about two and a half years ago, and when I tell you, uh, you have to be a senior pastor to just kind of know uh, the weight of what you carry uh, when you're in leadership. And it's so easy to be a critic from the crowd, right? It's like you're doing football. It's like, how could he throw that? <laughs> well, you get on the field and let a 400-pound linebacker come for you. <laughs> See how you throw the ball. <laughs> anyway, I digress. I say that to say I, uh, I'm, I am so thankful for the consistent, faithful, integral leadership of Pastor Mike and Barb Caminetti. And I think we ought to pause on this day and thank them for their yes, thank them for their commitment, thank them for not giving up, thank them for 35 years of standing at the gateway of hell and redirecting traffic to heaven. Come on, can we thank God for the incredible gift of your pastors and your leaders? Y'all could do better than that. We honor you. We thank God for who you are. Um, I said it in the service yesterday, I'm just in a season of life where I am not impressed with your intensity. Uh, I am impressed with consistency. People that just keep showing up. And so I'm honored to be here today. My family and my church family sends their love. I only get a few excused absences a year uh, from my church, but uh, my wife said, oh, faith family, absolutely, you go. Matter of fact, let me show you my family since we're family. Can you put the Madhu crew up there? That is my fam. That is my beautiful bride, Taylor Madhu. We've been married for 11 years, and those are our three little humans right there. So if you're wondering why I have this glow that emanates from my face, it is not just because I use exfoliating skin products. It's because I am a blessed man, and uh, I'm thankful for my family, and I'm excited to preach the Word today if you're ready to hear it. Are you ready for the Word? Ooh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. How many of you actually have never heard me preach before? I don't want to assume anything. Oh, oh that's quite a few of you. Okay. Uh, qu quick disclaimer. Um, so many different preaching styles. Some preachers are calm, quiet, and collected, and softly pontificate the processes of philosophy, theology, soteriology, and they just stand in one place behind a sacred desk to declare what the Lord has deposited in the deep recesses of their heart, soul, mind, and spirit. And they don't want you to say anything while they're preaching. Just be very quiet and don't get boisterous at all. Um, I'm not one of those preachers, okay? <laughs> Y'all will scare me. This is not a library. This is a sanctuary. So if you feeling what I'm saying, you can say amen. You can say preach that. You can say, mm, that was good. You can stand up in the middle if you want. Come on, it's 35 years. You can go, whoo, 
that was for me. <laughs> you can stand up in the middle and go, oh, that was for you. For real, you needed that. Any one of those will work. Uh, just be responsive today. Let's go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. And for the benefit of brevity, I just want to read verses 16 through 18. It's a whole lot of good stuff, but I just want to read verses 16 through 18 in the book of Acts, chapter number 16. When you're ready to read it, why don't you just say, yeah. yeah. If you need a little time to find it, say, hold on. I heard that, hold on, I'm going to wait. <laughs> just for you. <laughs> and it declares... Once, when we were going to the place of prayer. Ooh, let me just pause, because I didn't even know what this weekend was before I was about to preach this. They were going to a place of prayer. And I just want to pause and thank God for the incredible vision of this 24-hour prayer room. The Holy Spirit spoke to me last night in the service, and our church is sowing $10,000 into your legacy offering, because I just believe in this vision. So I just want to tell you, if this is your family, this is your church, everybody's got to participate in this. But all the way in the early church, woo, they had a place of prayer. And it says, on the way there, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. And she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And not three weeks later, but at that moment, the Spirit left her. Ooh, I could keep going, but I want to stop right there. Spoiler alert. This female slave who was possessed by a spirit who gets set free, her liberation caused Paul and Silas to be incarcerated. But then they found out that just because you're in chains, it doesn't mean you can't have church. So they started praising God at midnight. And when they did, all the prisoners' chains were loose. But this is not even what I want to talk about today. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I am intrigued by what Paul did to set this girl free because before he set her free by the power of the name of Jesus, it says he got so annoyed. Annoyed. I want to do something I've never done at Faith Family Church in all my years of coming here. I want to give you part of my title now. And then I'll give you the other part of my title later in the message. So if you leave early or you log off online, you're going to miss the whole message. I just want to give you part of my title now because I want to talk to you for about six and a half hours today. <laughs> Starting with this part of my title, I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us today. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to us today. Amen. <laughs> I'm annoyed. Oh, I forgot to mention, my father is here with me, Robert Medu Sr. Dad, would you stand up? I'm so glad that he's here. Come on, Dad. That's my pops. <laughs> I love it because he hates when I do that. He tells me all the time, don't you make me stand. But guess what? I got the microphone. But you got to know, right now, he is annoyed. <laughs> but traveling with my father actually reminds me of a ministry moment that is indelibly etched in my mind. I'll never forget, just years ago, when I was first starting out in the ministry, years ago, just first starting out preaching the gospel, I mean, I was just a young buck, a young buck. I was actually preaching and working at Banana Republic at the same time. Yes, I had a ministry of folding khakis during the week. And I preached the gospel on the weekend. And I'll never forget uh, getting a call from a church to preach their weekend services. Now remember, I'm just a young guy starting out in ministry, and I was so excited they were calling me to preach for their Sunday morning services. You gotta understand, up until this point, I had just preached to the youth group and their youth camps, but when they called me to preach Sunday morning, I said, oh, hold up, you boys made it. I'm moving on up. 
But they send me my itinerary for the weekend. As I'm looking over the itinerary, all of a sudden, my attention was arrested by my accommodations for the weekend. Because when I looked at the itinerary, it said that I would be staying at a motel, at a motel. <laughs> I didn't really trip at first because I was like, hold on, Lord, I'm the one that said if you can use anything, you can use me. And plus, I hadn't seen this motel yet. I said, let me wait and get to the motel and see what it looks like. And so the pastor picked me up and we pull up to the motel and oh, it, it, it was a mo. It was a motel. Everything from the exterior of this motel let me know what the interior was going to look like. I will never forget it. The pastor, before he dropped me off, he handed me my key to my motel room. The key to my motel room. The key to my, not a card, a physical key to my motel room. And I go up to the motel and I open the door and y'all, it looked like a scene from CSI. There was stains on the carpet and stains on the drapes and stains on the bed. As soon as I walked in, the pungent odor from the room hit me in the face and singed my nose hairs. I looked to the right, there was a group of roaches that looked at me like, are you gonna stay here for real? It was crazy. So I'm like, man, this, this is bad. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. I didn't, so I, I looked up the street, believe it or not, and there was actually a hotel up the street. Okay, just a few, few stars up from the what I was in. And I was like, well, maybe I could just switch and go to the hotel. I'm like, I'll pay for it. It's all good. I just want a clean bed to sleep in. So I was going to switch and go. Well, the problem is the pastor dropped me off at the motel and was picking me up in the morning. So I said, I'm either going to have to go to the hotel and come back to the motel for him to pick me up. And I don't want to be rude. I want to be a good guest. That would look bad. So I said, let me just call my father. Let me call my Nigerian father and ask him, would it look bad if I switched from the motel to the hotel. Woo, I will never forget it, because I called that Nigerian man over there. I picked up the phone, I called him, I'll never forget it. I said, Dad, I don't know if you can smell this through the phone. <laughs> but man, they got me in a motel and it's bad, and I'm wondering, will it look bad if I switch and go to the hotel? And I'll never forget what he said to me. First words out of his mouth were, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, would it look bad if you switch? Would it look bad if you switch? Of course it would look bad if you switch. You mean to tell me that you can't stay in a motel for one night? Son, you are not there on vacation. You are there to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't stay there for one night? He said, if the Apostle Paul can be shipwrecked and beaten and whipped for the gospel, surely you can stay in a motel for one night. <laughs> Y'all clapping, I was annoyed. Woo, I just hung up the phone and said, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> oh, and I'll never forget that moment. And to be honest with you, in hindsight, I now see the profound wisdom of my father because I now understand that it was not like my father was not being empathetic to my plight nor was he even advocating for me to stay in nasty motels I now have the wisdom to understand that what my father was trying to do was he was trying to get me to look at my circumstance through the lens of my purpose he was trying to get me to look at what I was going through, through what I was called to do. He was trying to get me to understand that the motel I was staying in was temporary, but the gospel that I'm preaching is eternal. And if I could just endure for one night and look at my circumstance through the lens of my purpose, it will change everything. I don't know who I came to preach to today, but I came to tell you, you have got to learn to look at your circumstance through the lens of your purpose. Pastor Barb was already getting in my message today. You are fixing your eyes on the problem, but God's saying, no, you need to fix your eyes on the purpose and fix your eyes on me, and that will give you perspective on the problem that you're going through. Can I tell you who hell is afraid of? Can I tell you people who are unshakable? It is the people who have learned to look at their circumstance through the lens of their purpose. People that have learned to get a powerful vision and understand that there is a greater story. There's a reason why I'm going through this, and I can't look at it for the way it is. 
I've got to look at it through the lens of my purpose and my assignment. Ooh, this brings me to my text today in the book of Acts that really chronicles the missionary journeys of a, the Apostle Paul. And how many know the Apostle Paul could teach a master's class on how to look at your circumstance through the lens of your purpose? Ooh. Paul was off the chain. You need to understand, especially if you're new to faith. Two-thirds of your New Testament was written by the hand of the Apostle Paul. Very few have walked the face of this earth that had the tenacity, the boldness, the stick to itiveness of the Apostle Paul. He was absolutely powerful. This is a man that would write letters and start revivals in cities and turn cities upside down. You couldn't stop Paul. They tried to stop him, but you couldn't because he learned to look at his circumstance through the lens of his purpose. They said, Paul, we're going to kill you. He said, that's cool. To die is game. They said, okay then, Paul. Okay then, we're going to let you live. He said, that's cool too. To live is Christ. He said, all right then, Paul, we're going to make you suffer. He said, that's cool too, because I already know that the present sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory of God that's going to be revealed on the inside of me. You can't stop me because no matter what I'm going through, chained or unchained, I've learned to look at my circumstance through the lens of my purpose. Oh, I feel this in here today. I'm trying to calm down, but my right toe is tingling. That's how much I feel like preaching. I love it because when you get to Acts 16, Paul is on his second missionary journey, but don't miss Paul's call and his conversion, which is in Acts chapter 9. I love Paul because this is a killer, a murderer turned church planner. Ooh, I love it because some of y'all think, well, God can't use me. My past is too messed up. Have you read the Bible? If God can take a church killer and make him a church planter, what is your excuse? You don't think God can use you? If, if I really had time, I would break down how the Apostle Paul was actually already moving at the speed of purpose before his conversion. He was already tenacious, just going in the wrong direction. I love that he was already moving somewhere and God had to get his attention. Shout out to some of you right now that are already moving at the speed of purpose. This is what I found. God does not call stagnant people who just want to sit on their blessed assurance and do nothing. But some of you are actually already moving. You're just moving in the wrong direction and if God could get your attention it would change everything I love it because Paul didn't even know that day when he was going to go persecute more Christians that a bright light was going to knock him off his high horse how many of you know he didn't know he had an appointment with God and some of you listening to this message don't even know this is your appointment with God he is getting your attention right now to call you into your purpose God knocked him off his high horse, blinded him so he could finally see. <laughs> I ain't going to mess with that. But only God could blind you to make you actually see. Led him all the way to Ananias. He opens up his eyes. And yes, he's been converted. And now he's called to his purpose. And in Acts chapter 16, he is on his second missionary journey with Silas. But you cannot appreciate his connection with Silas until you first understand the separation that happened with him and Barnabas. This was not his first missionary journey. This was his second. The first one started with a guy named Barnabas. And I love it because church, because, excuse me, Paul is new in the early church. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to connect him to a guy named Barnabas to go plant churches and preach the gospel. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit to connect Paul with Barnabas to go plant churches. I love it. Can you see them? Paul and Barney <laughs> going together on a missionary journey to plant churches. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit to call who? Paul and Barney together. This lets us know that there are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. I'm trying to help some of y'all that say, I got a purpose, I got a call, and all I need is me, myself, and I. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Any call from God will always connect you to community. It will always connect you to somebody else. You got to have somebody. I could preach it from the Bible. I could preach it in culture. Batman had Robin. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Even the Lone Ranger had Toto. You need somebody. <laughs> you got to have somebody with you. And here's Paul and Barney going together, preaching the gospel. And it went so well that they said, let's do it again. Let's run the missionary journey back. And I can see Paul and Barnabas going, yeah, let's do it. But all of a sudden, Barnabas goes, oh, yeah. 
and let's bring my nephew, John Mark, on the second missionary journey. And Paul goes, uh, we can bring anybody but him. He is not going with us at all. And then Barnabas is like, well, I think he should go. And Paul's like, I don't think he should go because he deserted us during the first missionary journey. And I don't have time for people that don't know how to stick to it. He can't go. And then Barnabas is like, well, I really think he should go. Well, Paul's like, I don't think he should go. And they get into a sharp argument. Read it when you get to the crib. Acts chapter 15. They get into a big fight in the early church. Imagine that. Ooh, the early church had fights. And they're going back and forth and back and forth. And if you want to know whose side I'm on, I'm on Paul's side. I am, I am, because I'm just, I'm, I'm like Paul. Paul is a builder, and if you're building something, you need some ride-or-die people with you. You need some people that won't quit and get offended and say, well, you didn't give me a back massage today, so I'm hurt, and I'm going to go home. No, I like people who are ride-or-die. I like people who will show up. I like people when you say, come at 7 o'clock, they'll be there at 645. I like people that show up, and that's Paul. And you need builders, but you also need Barnabas, too. And Barnabas is not a builder. Barnabas is an encourager. <laughs> and you need encouragers too. Even though encouragers sometimes annoy us builders. Because encouragers are like, come on, Paul, just have some grace. I know he messed up, but give him another chance. Paul, didn't God give you another chance? Come on! <laughs> and they're going back and forth. But they couldn't settle the disagreement. And they finally just agreed to disagree. And they went their separate ways. All of a sudden, Barnabas went with Mark, and they preached the gospel, and Paul picks up Silas, and they preached the gospel. They agreed to disagree and still went their ways, and the gospel was still preached. <laughs> Can I ask you something? Can I get in your business? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> do you have to demonize everybody you disagree with? Just because they don't see it the way you see it? And just because they don't want to do it the way you do it, do you have to demonize them? And everybody now is a hater if they don't see it how you see it. <laughs> this is the culture and climate in which we live. Because everybody has social media accounts and because you see your words in print, you think you are actually a, a certified journalist. So anybody that doesn't agree with you, you demonize them and say, uh, 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 I got that. see, you don't see it like I see it, so something is wrong with you. But I love that even in the early church, they had something we've lost in our culture today. We've lost just civil discourse. They agreed to disagree, and they went their separate ways, and the gospel was still preached, and lives were still changed. Can I make an announcement from heaven? You do know that God reserves the right to use people that you don't like. God can use people that you don't like. God can use people that you don't agree with. God does not have to check in with you before he chooses to use somebody. God will use whoever he wants to use. He will bless whoever he wants to bless. He will elevate whoever he wants to elevate. He will bring down whoever he wants to bring down. And he doesn't have to check in with you to do it. Because he's God and you are not. And I love that even in their separation, the gospel was still preached. John Mark went with Barnabas, and here's Paul and Silas going to preach the gospel. Ooh, I wonder what that interview was like to get Silas on the team. Because Paul didn't play. He's like, are you sure you ride or die, Silas? Silas so like, yeah, I'm riding out. He's like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, I'm sure. He's like, can you take a hit? You know, I was stoned in Lystra. Can you take a hit? He's like, I think so. And Paul's like, <laughs> Oh, what was that for? I'm just trying to see if you can take a hit. It's real in these church planting streets. <laughs> That's in my imagination. That's not in the Bible. Don't try looking that up later. <laughs> and here they go. <laughs> go on to preach the gospel. They went to Figria and preached the gospel. They went to Galatia and preached the gospel. I love what it says in Acts 16, 5. It says, and the churches were multiplied and the churches were strengthened. Oh. And all of a sudden, as they're traveling, we see something that we have not yet seen in the New Testament. They got ready to go to the province of Asia, modern day Turkey. And the Bible says, the Holy Spirit forbid them to go. And then they tried to go to Bithynia. And the Bible says again, the Holy Spirit forbid them to go. And when I read that, I was annoyed. Because I started thinking, wait a minute, they're not going to sell drugs. They are going to plant churches. You would think that if my motive is right and my mission is right, I would always have an open door. You would think 
that I, I'm going to do something that God has put me on the earth to do, that every time I would step out to do it, the Holy Spirit would go, dun, 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 here's an open door, have your way. But the Bible is clear. The Holy Spirit forbid them to go. I'm wondering if you understand that God doesn't just guide you with a go. He often guides you with a no. That sometimes your motive can be right, the mission can be right, and God will still prevent you from going. I'm speaking to somebody who's annoyed and frustrated at God right now because you had a plan, you had a vision, and you've been shaking your fist, and you're like, God, I know you called me to do this, but why are the doors not opening? Why am I not getting the funding? Why is it not happening? I came to tell you that God often will guide you with a no. The Holy Spirit forbids them to go to a certain province when they were going there to preach the gospel and plant a church. That is annoying. Come on, I have to understand that my car doesn't start when I'm trying to go to Krispy Kreme. Because that sugar will kill you. But what happens when your car doesn't start and you're trying to go to a Bible study? You're like, God, what is up? <laughs> this is annoying. And I'm really annoyed with Dr. Luke who writes the book of Acts. Because Luke is a doctor. How many know doctors are thorough? And so if the Holy Spirit forbid them from going, well, Dr. Luke, could you at least tell me how? <laughs> how did the Holy Spirit forbid them from going? Like, would the boat not start? <laughs> did Silas get a stomach ache? Like, let us know <laughs> how. But we don't even get those details because God is trying to get a message to us to let us know that I don't just guide you with a yes. I sometimes will guide you with a no. And I'm wondering if there's anybody in here who's lived long enough to learn how to praise God, not just for the yeses, but can you praise God for the noes? Is there anybody that can look back over your life and say, whoo, I'm glad I didn't get that job. I wouldn't have this business now. Whoo, I'm glad God didn't answer that prayer. I wouldn't be in the blessing I'm in right now. Whoo, I'm glad that they ghosted me and didn't call me back. I wouldn't have found the right one if they would have called me back to go out on that day. I'm telling you, you ought to thank God for his no. Because the Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. And so many times we want him to order our steps, but we forget that if he orders your steps, he must also order your stops. And often God will guide you with a no. So the Holy Spirit forbid them to go. So what do you do when you've gotten a no and the door has been shut? You wait to hear what the step is. That's what Paul did. He waited. This is why I'm so thankful for this 24-hour prayer room that you're about to have because it is going to be powerful because some of you think prayer is like talking to God who's a cosmic Santa Claus and you just give him your list and then you're mad when he doesn't come to pass or you think that God is like a, a slot machine in Vegas and you're like, okay, God, I put in my church attendance. Where's my blessing? <laughs> but I've learned often prayer is me sitting and listening, saying, God, what's next? Where do I go? And all of a sudden, Paul gets a vision in the middle of the night. He gets a vision of a man in Macedonia. He's like, I got it. Boys, we're going to Macedonia. I love that Paul waited and got a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come help me. He got a vision of a man in Macedonia. He got a vision of a man in Macedonia. He got a vision of a who? Where? A who? Where? That's the vision he got. Don't you love when you get a clear vision from God? You're like, woo, I know what I'm supposed to do. I got the vision now. Come on, we going to Macedonia. I got a vision of a... In. So here he is headed to Macedonia, and as soon as he gets to Macedonia, guess what he runs into? Not a man. <laughs> a women's Bible study. I'm in the Bible. Read it when you get to the crib. He, they're at the riverside. It is a women's Bible study. The fact that they're down by the riverside, Paul would often go into the synagogue. This is letting us know that there weren't even 10 Jewish men in the province to even have a synagogue. He runs right into a women's Bible study in Macedonia when he got a vision of a man in Macedonia. I'm preaching to some of y'all that are there right now. What do you do when your reality is contradictory to the vision that God gave you? Ooh, who am I?
am I talking to today? Have you ever had a season of life where your vision and your reality was contradictory to the vision that God gave you? And you're like, God, this looks nothing like what you showed me. What do you do when your reality is contradictory to the vision God gave you? I'll tell you what you do when your reality is contradictory to the vision. You stick to the mission. You stick to the mission that God has given you. Guess what Paul did? He didn't stay there and wait for a man to show up. Paul started preaching the gospel to all those ladies right there at the riverside. Paul said, this don't look nothing like my vision, but I got to stick to the mission and I still got to preach the gospel. Ooh, I don't know who this is for, but sometimes when you don't have a vision, you got to stick to the mission that God gave you. And he preached the gospel. And I love it because one of the ladies at this Bible study is a lady named Lydia, who was a baller and a shot caller. No, she was a businesswoman that was doing so well. She was so successful. She got saved. Her whole household got saved because Paul stuck to the mission. Everybody got saved. She invited Paul and Timothy and Silas over to their house. Can you imagine what Sister Girl's house looked like? I mean, she's selling pur purple cloth and balling. I mean, I can't imagine. They walk into the house and they're like, whoa, Lydia has got it going on up in here. She's got charcuterie spreads everywhere and marble floors. They're sleeping in the bed of the down feather bed that's just amazing, high thread count. They're like, this is awesome. They're taking laps in Lydia's infinity pool. They're like, I love preaching the gospel. <laughs> and they leave from Lydia's house and they go to the place of prayer. All that was my intro. And they go to the place of prayer. <laughs> and all of a sudden, as they're preaching, a woman possessed by a spirit Every time Paul gets up to preach, she's in the back. These men are servants of the Most High God. They've come to show us the way of salvation. That's day one. Paul's like, oh, all right, God bless you. Can, can I finish? Day two, Paul starts preaching. Here she comes again. These men are servants of the Most High God. they come to show us the way of salvation. Uh, all right, you said that yesterday. Day three, these men are servants of the Most High God. Day four, these men are servants of the Most High God. Day five, day six, I don't know how many days, but the Bible is clear. She did this for many days. And finally, Paul got so annoyed. Ooh, before I deal with his annoyance, let's first look at the fact she's possessed by a demonic spirit, and yet she's saying the right thing. They were servants of the Most High God. And they did come to show the way of salvation. So she's got a demonic spirit, but she's saying the right thing. This is why you need the Holy Spirit, not just for empowerment. You need the Holy Spirit for discernment. Because somebody could be saying the right thing, but saying it from the wrong spirit. And I love that Paul was wise enough to know, yeah, you're saying the right words, but your spirit is wrong. It's coming from a demonic spirit. And finally, he got so annoyed, so agitated, he turned around and said, not to her, she's not the enemy, she needs deliverance. He said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, Christ, come out of her. I came to tell somebody, stop speaking to the thing and start speaking to the spirit that's behind it. I'm talking to somebody that needs to walk up in your house and say, I speak to that spirit of depression and say, this holiday season, I'm actually going to have my joy because Jesus is my joy. You got to speak to that spirit of anxiety and say, I'm going to have my peace because he is the prince of peace. Speak to that spirit of infirmity and say, by his strength, Stripes, I am healed. Somebody needs to walk into your kid's bedroom and say, I speak to that spirit of rebellion. You got a call on your life. You're a world changer. I don't tell, care what the culture's calling you. There is a call of God on your life. Oh, I need a 10-second praise break for somebody that still believes in the delivering power of Jesus Christ. Woo! 2024 ain't here yet, but I'm going to speak to the spirit. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities. Oh, we tear down strongholds in the name of Jesus. Speak to the spirit. Speak to the spirit. That spirit of addiction that's trying to destroy your legacy and your family. Speak to it said to her in the name of Jesus, come out. And she gets free. Now here's what blows my mind. You would think that after this girl got free, there would be an applause. You would think that her freedom would lead to celebration. 
but that's not what happened. Oh, I'll give you something I didn't even give the service yesterday. It's interesting, she had people who were using her gift to make a profit. And so, although her freedom was what she needed, her freedom now became a liability to the people who were controlling her. I came to tell you, there are some people in your life that don't want you to be free because they have become the beneficiaries of your brokenness. And so anytime you start to step into the freedom that God has called you into, they're always going to pull you away from that. Sometimes it's their codependency because they want you to stay bound because they're benefiting from your brokenness. And all of a sudden, her controllers got mad because they saw that their prophet was gone. And the apostle Paul and Silas, the ones who just brought freedom into a girl's life, here's their reward. They were attacked by a mob. They stripped their clothes. They started whipping them and beating them over and over again. Understand that the Jews had a custom that you could not give somebody a beating past 39 lashes because in your rage of beating somebody, you could lose count and destroy their physical body. They had a rule, no more than 39, but they are not in a Jewish province. They had no rule. They were continually whipped, beaten, flesh lacerated. And then they took them and threw them in the inner part of the prison. It was a dungeon. And so now here they are, perhaps coughing blood, scars and wounds on their back and their legs. And they're in a dark place. And they're in this dark place, hear me, not because of their disobedience, but because of their obedience. What do you do when your obedience to God puts you in a dark place? What do you do when you did what God had called you to do? You did everything right, and now you found yourself in a dark place that makes no sense at all. I understand when my disobedience gets me in a dark place, but what do you do when you are obedient? And now you find yourself in a prison, and now you find yourself in chains. And I know you can't say anything because this is the thing that nobody in the church likes to talk about. We don't talk about how you can do the right thing and still end up in a dark place. How you can be obedient and still find yourself suffering and still facing persecution. But can I tell you, this is where the rubber meets the road in your faith. Because anybody can praise God when you get a raise. Anybody can praise God when you get a Tesla. Anybody can praise God when your kids are perfect and got straight A's and the marriage is great. But God wants to know, can you trust me in a dark place? Can you praise me when you did the right thing and you kept your integrity and now you're still suffering? That's when I want to know, can you still lift up a hallelujah? That's when your praise matters. Anybody can praise when everything goes right. I want to know, can you praise them and trust them when everything goes wrong? Here they are in a prison and it was their obedience to God that got them there. You got to understand, I've been raised in church. And so I've always heard people preach this text. And we love to preach, especially on New Year's Eve at midnight. They started praising God. And all of a sudden, there was an earthquake and their chains were loose. And how many know if you praise them at midnight, you get your breakthrough? I've seen it. I've preached it. Until I realized when you're in the inner part of the prison, you don't know whether it's daylight or whether it's midnight. They were already in a dark place. Luke is writing this. They didn't know what time it was. They weren't looking at their watch saying, okay, if we just praise for five more minutes, we're going to get a breakthrough. As a matter of fact, biblically, we have no record up to this point that when you praise God, he sends earthquakes to set you free. They were not praising God for their deliverance. You know what they were praising God from? Their devotion. They had always done it. They were just doing what they'd always done. They reckoned in their mind that if I praise God in Lydia's lap pool when everything was good, I better praise God when I'm in the prison because this situation might be bad, but I'm learning to look at it through the lens of my divine assignment. So God, you're still worthy even when I'm in the prison. You're still worthy even when I'm in chains. And no wonder God's presence
presence hit that place because they shouldn't have put the chains on their hands. They shouldn't have put the chain on their mouth because as long as you got a mouth to lift up the name of Jesus, oh, he inhabits the praises of his people and he will step in whatever environment that his praise is lifted up in. Oh, I wish I had some people that would get on your feet and open up your mouth like you knew that God inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, you ought to praise him like you want him to break chains. You ought to praise him like you want him to step in that dark situation that you're in right now. Woo! Watch this. Remain standing. They started praising God, and he showed up. I wholeheartedly believe he didn't send an earthquake. It was his manifest presence that came in that prison. Because he said, if y'all can praise me in that situation, I've got to get to where you are. I don't know who this is for, but can you praise him while you got the cancer treatment? Can you praise him while the spouse is gone? Can you praise him while you got the negative news? He is a present help in the time of trouble. I love it because their praise did not just set them free. The Bible says everybody in the prison got set free. Everybody's chains got loose. You have no idea the ramifications of your praise and your trust in a dark place. It will always affect somebody else because we are living epistles read of man. Somebody is watching you while you're going through this dark season. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare throw in the towel. It will affect somebody else's life. And they praised and their chains were loose. But this is where I got confused because if I'm in a dark place because of my obedience and I just praise God out of devotion and he sets me free, I don't need a word of knowledge to know what to do next. If I'm in a prison and I praise and the chains get broken and the doors are open, I am running out of there, y'all. I am running like C.D. Lamb. Shout out Dallas Cowboys. I am <laughs> gone. But they didn't. They stayed. Which made me go, why? But what happens next? After they stayed, the prison guard takes a knife, a sword. He's about to kill himself because he knows that all of those prisoners are under his watch and that to lose any prisoner, they would kill him anyway. So rather than wait for them to do it, he said, I'm just going to take my own life. And Paul says, wait! Don't do it. We're still here. Don't do it. And I want to pause right now and speak to that spirit of suicide. If the enemy has been whispering in your ear that you can't take it and you just need to take your life, God interrupted this message for me to tell you, don't do it. You're in a bad season, but your story is not over. Don't you dare take your life. God is going to use every piece of the pain and the brokenness. Don't do it. Paul says, don't do it. We're still here. What would make Paul stay in that prison? I wonder if it was his vision. Do you remember the vision? He got a vision of a, a man in Macedonia. When he got to Macedonia, he had a women's Bible study. When he got to Macedonia, there was a slave girl that was a woman. But all of a sudden, he gets into prison, and there is a man that's about to take his life. And Paul doesn't tell us who the man was, but I wonder if it was this prison guard. And Paul all of a sudden realized, oh, you're the reason why I came here. Oh, can I give you the rest of my title? My title's I'm annoyed, but let me finish it. I'm annoyed, but I'm assigned. I think in that moment, Paul understood. You are my assignment. There's a reason I had to get in this prison. I wouldn't have picked it for myself, but if it saves your life and it saves the life of these prisoners, yes, I'm annoyed, but I'm assigned. I'm assigned. Ooh, do you know what happened? 
that prison guard got saved, his whole household got saved, and all of a sudden, that prison guard, the prisoners, that slave girl, would be the first members of a church that Paul would later write a letter to in Philippians and talk about the joy that fills his heart every time I think of you. And it started because of closed doors, chains and whips on their back, things that were annoying, things that he wouldn't have picked. But all of a sudden he realized, this is my assignment speaking to somebody today that needs to look at the annoyance through the lens of your assignment. You're assigned to that family, mom. You're assigned to that family, sir. Don't you dare walk away. You're assigned to that city. You're assigned to that business. Don't let the annoyances make you miss the assignment. On this day of 35 years, can we thank God that in spite of all the annoyances, they stuck to the assignment. Thank you, Pastor Mike and Barb, for not giving up. Thank you for not walking away. Don't let the annoyance make you miss the assignment. I'm annoyed, but I'm assigned. Would you bow your heads? Father, I thank you for the assignment that you placed on all of our lives. Lord, these momentary afflictions are producing a greater weight of glory. So I'm praying for my brother and my sister who wants to give up. God, let strength and hope and life come to them today. Open up our eyes to see not just the annoyances, but the assignment. Not just the pain, but the purpose. Lord, especially in this holiday season where it seems like in the midst of all the holiday cheer, the pain gets highlighted. Holy Spirit, open up our eyes to see that if we're still here, if there's still breath in our body, God, you still got a purpose for our lives. So we refuse to give up. We fix our eyes, not on the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Our hope is in you. Our trust is in you. With heads still bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today or at Fairlawn or at Stowe and you've not put your faith in Jesus, hear me, I wish I could tell you that once you give your life to Jesus, everything will go perfect. You're going to get a raise and a bonus. That is not the faith that we have. Look at those who have gone before us. They were crucified upside down for this gospel. They were burned at the stake for this gospel doesn't mean your life is perfect, but it does mean you have an anchor. You have a hope that transcends this earth and will go on to eternity. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed at this location and all the locations, online, somebody that's watching right now and you wonder why you can't turn off the screen, it's because the Holy Spirit has gotten your attention. This is your divine intervention. God's speaking to you. If that's you and you say, Pastor Robert, I've not put my faith in this Savior, the one that will never be shaken. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I can see and say, I need to give him my life. Maybe there's even a season you were walking with the Lord and your heart's gotten cold and you turned away, maybe because of the annoyances, but right now you feel your heart breaking again and he's calling you back home. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand saying, I need to put my faith in Jesus. Just lift it up high enough and long enough to where I can see it. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yes. Thank you, Lord. I see those hands. Anybody else? Hallelujah. Can we pray this one prayer? We're going to say it as a big family, but especially those of you who responded. The power is not in the words, but it's in your heart connecting to it. Would you just say this? Say, Jesus, I need you. I cannot do life without you. Jesus, I know that you lived the life that I was supposed to live. You died the death that I was supposed to die. You took my place. So my response is to give you everything. Forgive me of my sin. Make me brand new. My hope is in you and you alone. From this moment forward, I'm walking with you, not just on the mountain, but even in the valley, 
Give me perspective. Give me purpose. Even in the midst of pain. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you meant what you prayed, can we give God praise today? Oh, come on, we can do a whole lot better than that. Can we give King Jesus all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory? Hallelujah. God bless you, faith family.